I mentioned the other day, in fact, before Ronald Judy appeared here while he was traveling, I mentioned the other day that uh, after 1988, the formative collection collective of the uh, journal uh, began to expand itself uh, and enrich itself in many different ways. And the first expansion, the first permanent enrichment involved Ronald coming to the collective in 1990. 90. 90. That's right. So 1988 was the collective's founding, 1990. This makes him almost as old as the rest of us. No. <laughs> as you can tell, we have the relationship of real friends, despite the fact that we're also academic colleagues. <laughs> yes. We try to stand as a corrective to the institution, but we don't always succeed. There are two remarkably important books here. I'll just mention them. You all know what they are. The, I think, still undervalued 2000 volume called Sociology Hesitant, um, from, which is a special issue of, of Boundary 2 that won uh, a prize from the Council of Editors of Learned Journals. And then from 1993, a very important book, Disforming the American Canon, which book I think has done uh, probably sh as much as could be done to uh, arrest any kind of, um, let's call it Christian nationalist account of the identity of Africans displaced to America by keeping the relationship of those people, those stolen and kidnapped people to their proper tongue, which was Arabic, and their proper tradition, which was a version of Islam. Um, I like to think of our work as being in important ways in contact. And one of those ways, uh, I think, appears, occurs in the fact that our, our two recent big books kind of come out at the same time. Uh, and for each of us, the word poiesis plays an important role. And I will mention to you only the title from Duke University Press, Sentient Flesh, Thinking in Disorder, Poiesis in Black, which I also have described, and some people have agreed with this, I have described as perhaps the most vital and Amer significant in American terms, significant way to re-understand the matters that are addressed today by various forms of black pessimism, black nihilism. So without saying a great deal more, and I could say more, but I won't, uh, I will give you R.A. Judy, whose title today is Poetic Socialities and Aesthetic An Anarchy. Please welcome him back. Of course, I'm not as old as my senior colleagues, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a young chick. This, this, uh, this room, for me, has lots of memories. Uh, we've been in it many times. And uh, the last time we were in it collectively, as, a, as a, a collective in an event like this, thanks to Don's generosity, which I want to thank him for again now, was uh, to commemorate one of the founders of the journal. Bill Spanos, and it was our last collective meeting with our good friend, uh, Joseph Dzhezh, and I'm happy to have had that occasion. He and I ended up driving back to, uh, to Boston together, so I've been thinking about that all the time I've been sitting in this room, and Joe has been very much with us, and I've heard his voice invoked often in the hallways, especially right now with 
in response to what Joe would have said to what, what Don said. I'm very thankful uh, uh, for the time I've had on the journal and the ways in which, and I, I knew all the members of the original. In fact, I'm the one who came up with the, the term constitutional collective. I uh, took to calling them because of the contractual relationship with Duke. And, and uh, um, as Don said, and as Tony said, um, my inclusion into the group uh, really uh, uh, um, um, had an impact upon, upon my career. And uh, I found it uh, one of the few, if not the only, places uh, in, in the academy in this country that was willing to seriously entertain the thinking that I was trying to do. Right? So what I share with you is less a formal talk than early, albeit somewhat developed, thinking about a new project I call Poetic Socialities. That's not quite right. Better to say a present figura issuing from a long-term project, the reference point of orientation for which is the question, who speaks and can speak the human and how? This question has served as a guideline for a sustained inquiry into the conditions of possibility for the human in our modernity, following the line of thinking indicated with Franz Fanon's remarking in Paul Noir Mas Blanc that the Negro, le Negre, the, yes, Hortens, <laughs> emerges when one metaphysics is abolished and another is imposed. What interests me here are the workings of what I think of as cosmic hegemony, meaning the conditions and processes whereby a specific, any specific narrative that establishes and sustains the order of cosmic reality gets imposed as encompassing absolutely all being. In the passage I've just alluded to, Fanon refers to such cosmic reality as système de référence, he does so with an eye towards Sartre's being and nothingness, where it is used in translation of Heidegger's concept of referential totality, Wegensgansheit, whereby the activity of signification constitutes the world and its worldliness. This is also what Charles Sanders Peirce called semiosis, the process of which he construed as isomorphic with thinking and as such a function of sociality. Succinctly put, Systems of reference or semioses always indicate the world wherein human being exists and lives with relevance. The focus of poetic sociality is on how elements come into confluence in the semioses of the world. This is very much a question of action. Accordingly, attending to the how of semiotic confluence inevitably entails attending broadly to the activity Aristotle termed mimesis. More narrowly, it involves attending to that particular sort of mimesis he called poesis, which because it formally exhibits what it exposits, change and action over time, we can reasonably construe to connote human creating in semiosis. It is the species activity of actualizing in discrete material forms of signification any given collective conception of being in the world in accordance with a specifiable set of practices of living. In sentient flesh, I have termed such semiotic confluence parasemiosis, to connote the confluence of multiple vectors of, ref of referential totality without synthesis, without synthesis. W.E.B. Du Bois described the flow of such multiple vectors as the thousand and one little actions which go to make up life, essential to any clear conception of the group life taken as a whole. Taking up his project of achieving a science of ethics as a serious point of departure for reimagining sociality, sentient flesh supplies an account of how those people defined by capitalist modernity as proprietary things called Negro created and sustained in the interstices of that world order discrete forms of parasemiotic poesis indicative of multifarious sets of practices of living, which expressed ways of performing human being across generations. Poetic Socialities continues interrog the, the interrogation of the human along these lines. Apropos, the studied contemplation of an expansive range of contemporary parasemiotic poetic performances from dance and music to poetry and prose literature practiced by geographically dispersed populations across the planet that have come to be designated as black a definitively modern element in the construal of these populations as black 
is their supposedly being constitutively non-octochthonous to the spaces they inhabit. Instances of such that I am concerned with are the Sidi or the Shidi of India in Pakistan, the Suri of Oman, as well as the Haritin of Mauritania, Morocco, Western Sahara, and Algeria, the Wasfan in Tunisia, and the peoples of Tawirga in Libya. A notable thing about each of these populations is that their poetic performances, the parasemiosis of which is usually marked as formal hybridity, are regarded as fundamental to the collective national culture. The music and dance of the Suri, for example, is officially designated Musika Oman Ataklidiya, traditional Oman music. Much in the same way the blues and jazz are considered the original American music. Iterations of the same tendency occur with the rumba kua, the samba of Brazil, as well as the stombali of Tunisia. Contra the culturalism of this tendency, whereby these groups, blackness is specified as a function of cultural performance, abstracted from the material and political economic conditions determining their social status. Poetic socialities regards these poetic performances as displays of how each of these peoples perform ways of being in common on the earth in a positional relation to the specificities of their national identity. Indeed, a common feature of their respective poetic socialities is that they somehow trouble both the imperial colonial conception of polity legitimated by conquest or possession through settlement and the post-colonial conception of indigeneity as the supreme claim to natural sovereignty. And for the risk of messing up my time a bit, I want to pause a minute. This is an intervention in a discourse that's concerning me a great deal that's happening among, and it relates to my work with, with, with this from the American canon and my work as an Arabist, around the Sahel that's taking place in African discourses in the wake of, of George Floyd, where there's this postulation that, 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 that there's an inherent racism in the Sahel but also it carries with the population, the populations there are somehow not autochthonous. And, and what interests me is how we move from the period in which, in which for the ancient Greeks, the Libyans who were autochthonous were called the Ethiopians and the Libyans. Or even in 1932, for the French, they speak of the autochthonous Negro populations of the south of Tunisia to the proposition that none of these populations are autochthonous and they're only there as a result of modern slavery, right, and sub-Saharan African slavery. So I want to understand that movement and the way in which these particular populations that I'm, I'm looking at challenge that, right, and the efforts to domesticate them. But it's a challenge that really shakes up some of the fundamental premises of our current world order. So I, I won't interrupt myself again. I just wanted to give you a kind of marker of where I'm going with this and why these things matter. Attending to these disparate poetic socialities then entails the comparative interrogation of their, of their poetic practices and attendant formal understanding, how they think about it. This interrogation is based on the premise that local poetic style expresses the idiomatic procedures evolved to co cope with the circumstances and predicaments of the immediate surrounding world, and that carefully studying the traditions of such poetic socialities might provide us with the animative materiality with which it is possible to imagine being earthlings. The aim in the comparative study it's, it's the beginning of Ramadan and I can't fast for health reasons so I have my tisbih it's a compensation but it's interfering with my turning the page so I'll have to make a decision. Such poetic sociologies is not merely to show there are alternative archives of knowledge, but that careful engagement with those archives calls for a different way of thinking in terms of parasemiosis as an intellectual practice. In other words, the study of poetic socialities is committed to reimagining the field of humanities as a crucial aspect of social well-being, justice, dignity, and individual rights, the expressed agenda of what Tunisians often refer to and still call the revolution of dignity across the planet. The gesture of such a study is toward thinking in practice, being in common on earth. Unquestionably, this is a call for renewed critical theory. It must be underscored, however, that this criticism is not the performance of that which seeks to merely become something in terms of the current conceptual as well as political order of the world. Rather, 
It seeks to think with the movements of poetic sociality engaged in its disordering. It is a thinking in disorder. How else can we even begin to understand people's irrepressible quest for freedom and dignity? This question warrants a clarification. Although the popular earthly calls for dignity today are clear echoes of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and so reverberate with Kant's, they do not share his postulate of an absolute value, the basis of which is a transcendental truth, pure practical reason qua morality, rather than expressions of such an absolute value which presumes the abstraction of the human as its vehicle, these current calls for dignity are of relational value. Individual value is always that which is good for someone in relation to someone else. The challenge entailed in attending to popular calls for dignity then is to attend to the particularities of each parasemiosis, to the needs and capacities of ways of being human again on Earth. Now, to give you some sense of what is at play in this contemplation, I point out that the phrase poetic socialities is a riff, and it's a riff on the 11th century common air, Islamic peripatetic philosopher Ibn Sina's conception of the role poetic expression's cognitive as well as affective force plays in the instantiation of sociality. That concept was a crucial articulation of the Islamic Arabic language reception of Aristotle's peripoetikes, or as we call it in English following the Latin translation, poetics. That reception was inaugurated circa 932, common air, by Abu Bashir Mata with his Arabic translation of the poetics from a Syriac version that dated from around 900, which was based in turn on a circa 1700 Greek manuscript. Mata's most famous student, Abu Nasr Muhammad al-Farabi, wrote the first substantive commentary of the poetics called Risala fi Qawaneen Sinat al-Shir, Treaties on the Canons of the Art of Poetry. This detailed commentary took up and, expand, and expanded on the Alexandrian Proemian tradition, according to which the rhetoric and poetics were added to the six treaties of the Organon and treated as branches of logic. Yet al-Farabi's extremely short essay Jawamia Asher, Mark, and I can't translate that. The translation would take actually four sentences because there's no English equivalent for the concept of a Jawamia. It's a very dynamic one. Shir, of course, is poetry for the moment. Marks the extent to which his engagement with the issues of poetics exceeds Aristotle's, as well as that of the Alexandrian tradition. The first move El Farabi makes in breaking new grounds is his conception of a tahir, the term he coined to designate the creation and arranging of mental images, which we can render as creative imagining. He extrapolates this concept from Aristotle's account in Book 4 of, Peri, of Perisikis of Fantasia, the psychological faculty whereby images are generated, which again, following the Latin, we render in English as imagination. In Aristotle's account, while an essential faculty in the human activity of cognition, imagination is distinct from both aesthesis sense perception, and dianoias, intellection or thinking. There can be no thinking however without imagination and no imagination without sensation. Attending to imagination's psychological function which was to create or cause the imaginable El Farabi's next move was to consider its relationship to, a, to, to, a, to, a, to aesthetics or aesthesis mediated through poetic mimesis. More precisely, he explored the way by which figurative language in its similitude of sensible experience engenders a tahir, the creative imagining. So as to better appreciate what is at stake in El Farabi's connecting mimesis and imagination, we should pay some attention to the particularities of his understanding of Aristotle's concept of mimesis. The Arabic term matta coined to translate the Greek mimesis is al muhaka a cognate of the polyvalent verb haka, which copiously connotes the activities of telling, giving an account, speaking, as well as mimicking, assimilating, and being attuned or in harmony with. The narrative connotation of this term more or less aptly captures Aristotle's sense of the mimesis praxios, mimesis of action, which he postulates is the telos 
of both tragedy and epic. Describing this mimesis of action as the compositional structure, synthesis of events, he then calls it mythos, which of course we render in English as plot. <clears throat> the plot is the mimesis of action, he says. And because the most potent means of emotional effect in tragedy are components of plot, it is the first principle and soul of tragedy. His identification of, of mimesis with synthesis makes clear that its truthfulness is not about preciseness in imitating an extra poetic reality consisting of events as they happen daily in relation to human actions. Rather, the poetic mimesis of action requires the selection and condensation of a few moments of these events in the creation of a chain of truly tragic events, a mythos. Mimesis, in the sense, is not concerned with fidelity in imitating the particulars of the quotidian phenomenon of reality, the sort of thing Aristotle refers to as relating actual events, genomene legion, which is the business of historical narrative, but rather with the representation of the universal significance of those particulars through the portrayal of certain types of persons in action, which he describes as relating the possible. Genoitolegian, and maintains is more philosophical and elevated than history. This will prove to be a key point of distinction between Aristotle's and El Farabi's respective theories of mimesis. El Farabi was well aware that Mata's tendency to translate certain Greek conceptual terms into Arabic was problematic, particularly his rendering of, of, of tragedia as El Madih, panegyric, and Komodia as El Haja, invective poetry. Nevertheless, he not only accepts the translation of mimesis as el muhaka, but uses it to designate the definitive feature of what he terms el aqawil, al shi'ariya, poetic statements. As such, al muhaka connotes various forms of figurative language from tashbih, simile, and al ista'ara, metaphor, to al qinaya, metonymy, which are constitutive elements of al qiyas, al shi'ari, of poetic syllogism itself one of the two forms of potential syllogism, that which is portraying or representational, temthilin. Near the beginning of his canons, after summarizing Aristotle's division of statements into certain and uncertain, truthful and fallacious, Al-Farabi provides a definition of Al-Muhaka, differentiating it from fallacious sophistry, Al-Mughlit. He says, my mises, Al-Muhaka liche, is not the delusion of imagining of something, rather, it is its resemblance or similitude. For the poet's task is not to empirically conveil material reality, naql al waqiyah nor is it to delude the audience that what they hear is true. Rather, there is between them something of an implicit contract that what the poet says is merely a simulacrum of reality. Tashbih kadhab lil waqiyah This definition is resonant with Aristotle's description of mimesis in Book 4 of Poetics, as a species of the natural widespread zoological behavior of mimicry. And that is the sense in which he uses uh, um, um, mamistai, and as one of the natural causes of poetry. Widespread as this genus of activity might be among fauna in Florida, it is flora rather, Florida, yes, well. <laughs> it is most pronounced in humans, for whom it is the most archaic mode of getting knowledge. my thesis about things in the world. That is to say, through the imitation of things, which is why everyone enjoys mimetic objects. Such archaic mimesis is, of course, in relation to the perception of extant sensible things, aesthesis, in precisely the sense El Farabi defines El Muhakal the similitude of things. Yet such relation to the sensible is also what Aristotle expressly states is not the business of the mimesis of action essential to epic poetry and tragedy, which is the representation of persons in action. That is solemnly elevated and not the imitation of sensible things. Aristotle, of course, draws a distinction between this poetic mimesis of action and the archaic mimesis he describes at the beginning of the poetics. This distinction turns on how he works the edamin of poesis, which is, of course, poeio, connoting to make, or paraphrasing Plato, the human activity causing the passage of anything from non-being to being, 
So the poesis under analysis in Aristotle's poetics is fundamentally an art of making, the aim of which is mimesis in action, having the primary element of mythos. Moreover, the poetics is emphatic that the arrangement of actions, mythos, is not equivalent to the fabrication of similitude. In contrast, El Farabi's sense of mimesis, El Muhakeliche, the similitude of things, reflects the etaman, etaman, forgive me, of the Arabic term a shi'r, as in al aqwal a shi'ariya, poetic statement, and that is sha'ara, and includes in its range of connotation to feel or perceive something with one of the five senses. Accordingly, the aim of a shi'r is the dynamic similitude of the experience of things by way of vivid figurative language. Customarily, we render the Arabic ashir and the Greek poesis into English as poetry. In so doing, we allied the connotative distinction between the two terms and the real distinction between the performative tenets of their respective practice traditions. Insofar as both Aristotle and El Farabi developed their respective theories of mimesis on the basis of those performative tenets, aligning the connotative distinction between the Greek and Arabic terms effectively deracinates or at best obscures what is at stake in El Farabi's deviation from Aristotle's thinking. El Farabi was well aware of that distinction, offering a brief comparative analysis of Greek and Arabic poetry in Juami Asher. He says of the Arabs, they regard a statement as poetry when it is metered verse, arranged into parts enunciated in equal measure. They could care less whether or not it is composed with mimesis. Then remarking further that Homer, the poet of the Greeks, used no rhyme scheme, he says, for the ancients, meaning the Greeks, the substantive essence of poetry is that it be an expression composed of mimesis, also arranged in parts and enunciated with equal measure. Everything else in it is not essential, although it may improve the poetry. The most important of these two, he continues, for the substantive essence of poetry for the ancients is mimesis, el muhaka, meaning, of course, Aristotle's mimesis of action. And the knowledgeable study, ilm, of things with which mimesis is effected. The least important for them is meter. Given the comparative context, undoubtedly, both the phrase mima yuhaka and el muhaka refer to Aristotle's mimesis praxios, mimesis of action and not the similitude of the experience of things in El Farabi's definition. He appears to be struggling with Mata's translation of mimesis as El Muhaka, precisely because while it seems to adequately convey Aristotle's specialized sense of mimesis of action, this is clear from the reference to Homeric epic. It does not describe the Arabic poetic practice of prioritizing the evocative force of figurative language as similitude, as similitude of the sensible, which is much more akin to the archaic sense of memithai as a primary mode of knowledge about things in the world. Working that kinship, El Farabi extrapolates a general theory of mimesis, inclusive of Aristotle's mimesis of action, as well as the Arabic similitude of the experience of things effectively transfiguring Matas al muhaka as its designator. The energy for that transfiguration comes from his identification of al muhaka with what he calls a tahir, creative imagining. Mimesis as statement, al muhaka kaul, he says, is to compose a statement with matters that imitate the thing, that is, a statement indicative of the matters imitating the thing. What is intended by to compose a statement with matters that imitate the thing is the creative imagining of that thing, either the imagining of it in itself, or in something else. This tahir is the processual psychological disposition of imagining, of making the imaginable through inextricably extricating with el muhaka. I'm sorry, interacting, forgive me, with el muhaka, whereby similitude of the sensible, afwan, figurative discourse, energizes imagining such that, he continues, someone can imagine something in a given situation and then act precisely as if its existence was confirmed by sense perception or demonstration, Burhan. Thus, the intended purpose of statements that make the imaginable, and he calls these al-aqawil al-mukhayala, is to incite the listener towards doing the thing being imagined. 
What is germane here regarding our concept of poetic socialities is how by characterizing mimetic statement, al-qawl al-muhaka, as al-qawl al-mukhayr, and identifying it with takhyil, al-farabi effectively established the philosophical study of poetry as encompassing both the techne of poesis as well as the psychology of its recipient's response. Does anybody have fingers that aren't sweaty? Discerning an isomorphic relationship between the activity of poetic mimesis and the mental activity of image creation or imagining. And in so doing, he laid the grounds for the subsequent treatment of poetry as a mode of knowledge, warranting epistemological analysis. These are the grounds on which Ibn Sina elaborates his conception of the role poetic expression's affective force plays in the instantiation of sociality. The first part of his monumental work on science and philosophy, Kitab al-Shifa, the Book of Healing, is on logic and contains a section on poetry. While aspects of this section entail a periphrastic engagement with Aristotle's poetics, overall, it is a formulation of Ibn Sina's own theory of al-Shir mutlaqin, universal poetics, the precepts of which are extrapolated from his comparative analysis of both Arabic and Greek poetry, thereby exceeding the parochial nature of Aristotle's poetics with its exclusive focus on the Greek. Clearly following in Al-Farabi's footsteps, Ibn Sina begins by defining poetry as kalam mukhayyat, imaginative discourse. A slightly clumsy but somewhat more adequate rendering is discourse of the imaginable or even the clumsier discourse activating imagining. In both Al-Farabi's sense of al-aqawil al-mukhayyala and Aristotle's sense of geniotto legian. This general definition has further qualifications. It is imaginative discourse composed as metered, measured utterances, and with the Arabs, they are rhymed. Being metered means the utterance is rhythmic. Measured means equal tempo intervals between metered utterance, and being rhymed means utterance ends with the same letter or sound. Again, aligned with Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina is interested in the psychological effect of poetry as the proper object of logical read philosophical study. And in his view, the logical study of poetry is concerned with poetry insofar as it animates imagining al-mukhayyat. That is to say, the discourse to which the psyche submits being attracted to certain matters and repulsed by others without deliberation, cogitation, and choice. In summary, he says, it is the study of that which animates, tanaf'al, non-cognitive psychological affective excitation, in fa'al al nafsiyin without reflective cognition. This excitation results from the dynamic interaction between al-muhaqa, mimesis, and a tahil, creative imagining. Along these lines, Ibn Sina describes tahil as a mode of knowledge that parallels but is distinct from a tasdiq, demonstrative knowledge. Both of these modes of knowledge achieve a consensus or communal compliance. The difference is that a tasdiq achieves this with apophantic reasoning, while a tahil achieves it by way of mimesis engendered amazement and admiration, a ta'jib, as well as the pleasurableness of the utterance itself. The presumed modes of demonstrative assent to truth and conviction, tasdiq, he says, are limited and finite. Imaginative representation, a tahilat wal muhakiyat, however, are not limited or, fi or fixed. What is commendable in poetry is the innovative creator, al-muqtara al mutadah Poetry in general is the non-apophantic mode of knowing the world that not only predates philosophy as a, systematic, as, as a syst systemic collective knowledge, but remains more, remains, remains more prevalent among the vast majority of people who, as he says, assent more to creative imagining, a tahil, than demonstrative knowledge, a tasdiq. As such, it can aim at conformity and civic purpose, al-agrad al madaniyah which is its primary function among the Greeks. Ibn Sina has in mind here Plato's critique as well as Aristotle's analysis of epic and tragedy. Or it can aim at arousing amazement and admiration, a ta'jib, which is its primary function among the Arabs. Each of these aims, however, results from the force of mimesis. Ultimately, Ibn Sina's general poetics is based on the postulate that mimesis, in the archaic sense Aristotle spoke of, is something natural to humans and fundamental to all poetry. Accordingly, what he calls al-muhaqa al-shi'riyah, 
poetic mimesis, is central to his analysis of poetry. And in that analysis, he attends carefully to the perceptible media of mimesis, specifically the sound that is heard, al masmu' min al-qawl, its formal variety and the ways in which it evokes imagining. Two of the three mimetic image evoking aspects of poetry delineates are about the arrangement of sound, its melody, the quality and tunefulness of which undoubtedly affects the psyche, whereby it is moved to sadness or anger or some other mood, and its meter, the rhythm of which can be either frivolous or solemnly reverent. As for the third, the words themselves that invoke imagining with their mimesis, these two can be related to sound through the hesitation between sound and sense. In focusing on sound and sense in relation to figures of speech and thought, Ibn Sina makes understanding the dynamic interaction of aesthesis, mimesis, and creative imagining central to the knowledgeable study of poetry. Not only do the media of poetic mimesis provide the perceptibles entailed in the invocation of creative imagining, but that imagining is one of the psychological factors of al hiss al mushtariq which is Ibn Sina's rendering of Aristotle's term, aesthesis koine, koine, forgive me, common sense. To denote the processes whereby the raw perceptions of the five specialized senses are coordinated into perceptions of particular objects. Aristotle is unclear about the relationship of imagination to this process. Ibn Sina, however, provides a detailed account of the linkage between raw sense perception, al idrak al awl, and that of imagination, al idrak al which combined give distinctive form and meaning to perceptibles. In this account, al hiss al mustarik is identified with creative imagining, a tahir. And with respect to poetic mimesis, this identification suggests the Stoic influence Latin rendering, specifically Cicero's translation of Aesthesis Koine, as sensus communis, in his De Oratore, to mean the natural human sensitivity for other humans and community. <coughs> we can draw two pertinent points from this. First, while expressed poetic mimesis achieves a vividness in presentation of the mimetic object that so animates the imaginative faculties of mind, the audience is brought to the exact same affective state as though having an immediate experiential perception. As already remarked, Ibn Sina referred to this, this capacity of mimesis as tanaf'al, and its consequence, al infa'al which for him has everything to do with the actuality of the sensible. Poetic mimesis animating creative imagination can be construed as energia in Aristotle's sense of the term, which following Joe Sachs we might render as being at workness instead of actuality. In other words, mimesis is the activity that actualizes the activity of experiencing the world. The social political aspects of this are not to be overlooked. When Ibn Sina says the vast majority of people assent more to creative imagining, tahir, than to demonstrative knowledge, a tasdiq, he is restating Al Farabi's determination in Ara Ahl al Madin al Fadla, the ideal city, that the worldly knowledge required in such a city is attained by its rulers through apophantic reasoning and demonstratively verified empirical perception, while the remainder of its population, those who are ruled, attain it through mimetic similitudes. By that account, Hylomorphic poetic mimesis dynamically sustains el hiss al mushtarik which we can now take to reference the system of self-evident facts of sense perception that is constitutive of community because it discloses the existence of something in common. In the spontaneity of this disclosure, the innovative creativity Ibn Sina insists was poetry's essence, the conditions of possibility of community are manifest. More specifically, poetry makes apparent the energia of mimesis, the essential role figurative language and symbolic representation play in civic purpose, which for both Al Farabi and Ibn Sina is to facilitate perfection of the conditions for universal and concordantly individual happiness in fulfillment of human being. And the term, of course, they use for this is Sa'ada, which is their rendering of the Platonic Aristotelian term, a diomena. To reiterate, there are two roots to this perfection knowledge based on demonstration and objective certainty, a tasdiq, and that based on poetic mimesis, animation of creative imagining, a tahir. The disclosure of community possibly occurring with poetic energy, however, also reveals the possibility of its reformulation. 
and of precisely the sort of profound political change the Abbasid revolution achieved, making good use of symbolic representation, in particular that of al-Umm al-Islamiyya, the Islamic community formed by the Prophet Muhammad as the ideal polity in al-Medina. Cognizant of this capacity of poetic mimesis, al-Farabi postulates a necessary qualification for the legitimate supreme ruler of, this, of the ideal city to be perfection of the imaginative powers, qawat al-mukhayla. So he can receive knowledge of particulars from the active intellect, either directly or through mimesis, mima yuhakiya. He further stipulates that this ruler have the linguistic ability to enhance the imagination when expressing knowledge in the course of guiding others to happiness. Emphasis is on perfection of the subject as meaningfully discovered in the sheer sensible pleasure of poetic mimesis, the pleasure of the resonance between the expression and the world, and then discovering to be so in common with others. This brings us to the second point, which is that poetic mimesis animates creative imagining in a way that engenders a spontaneous affective community. made aware of its constitutive engagement with the order of sensible things. The term Ibn Sina uses for such being in common with others in poetic energia is al umma al-shi'ariya, the poetic or aesthetic community. So when I say the phrase poetic socialities is a riff on Ibn Sina's conception of poetic expression's role in the instantiation of sociality, I mean it is a synoptic, paraphrastic translation of the conceptual lineage expressed by the term al-umma, al-shi'ariya. I have been interested in this question, or this question, really, of poetic sociality since my youth, when like so many of the black youth of my generation, I was energized by the poetry of the last poets in Gil Scott Heron, as well as the black arts movement, a particular touchstone for, of which for me was Nikki Giovanni's 1968 collection, Black Feeling, Black Talk. I still have uh, my, my 68 copy of that, which, which is dog-eared but held together with tape and forever being read. But also Don, Don, Don Lee, Kwa Haki Madhabuti, who my aunt Arnita, one of the early financial backers and boosters of his third world press, took me to meet in 1968. Brash youngster that I was, I shared with him some of my poetry. And generous elder that he is, he's still with us, he encouraged me to do more. This investment in poetry was enhanced by trips to Harlem visiting family in the early 1970s, where I was exposed to the Bronx block party scene, which is to say the archaic days of hip hop. I recall understanding these things as part, and it's a recollection that's confirmed because I kept a, a poetry notebook that I still have. Few close loved ones have actually seen it because it was adolescent poetry, but I indeed was thinking in these, these ways. I have a record of thinking. I recall understanding these things as part of a social movement imbricated with the political movement of black power. So I began to research and teach the black poetic tradition, first at a liberation school that was sort of affiliated with the Black Panther Party, and then at the Afro-American Cultural Arts Center. Apropos this moment, commemorating this moment, meaning now, the 50th anniversary of Boundary 2. This was in 1972. My question found further sustenance in the Arabo-Islamic poetic tradition, a sustenance provided through the poetic pedagogy of Ta'ari. This then was the experiential background against which the ideas of the Tunisian writer and intellectual Mahmoud al-Mis'adi shared with Muhammad Salah Umri in a 1994 interview about the poetic nature of popular Tunisian consciousness set me to reflect on the December 2010 popular up uprisings with regard to al umma al shariya During the 10 years from 1958 to 1968, al-Mis'adi was Minister of National Education and charged with implementing the Habib Bourguiba government's national education reform, he sought to engender in the Tunisian people an existential type of subjectivity capable of an ongoing open-ended practice of discovery. Arguably, that project, which was very much informed by his study of El Farabi and Ibn Sina's analysis of the close relationship between poetic expression and creative imagining, and the role that relationship plays in the formation of communal qua social consciousness, was an enactment of Franz Fanon's postulate 
that poetic invention was requisite for achieving a truly liberated post-colonial world. Insofar as the Bourguiba Misadi project emerged from the specificities of post-independence politics, it was those politics that made it possible to think its subject. Now, understandably, we might be inclined to recognize in this project some resonance with Jacques Rancière's concept of aesthetic community. After all, Rancière, in his attempt to differentiate politics from the philosophy of politics, is concerned with what he terms the primary aesthetics at the core of politics. Aesthetics here is expressly meant in Kant's sense of the system of a priori forms determining what presents itself to sense experience, which Rancière interrogates as being about the experience of a common world, or as he puts it, le partage de sensible, the distribution of the sensible. In that vein, he shows how those defined by political philosophy since Aristotle as not being in possession of orthos logos, the discourse of right reasoning, requisite for partaking in, political, in politics, disturb this discursive order by making themselves intelligible and heard, thus instigating a dissensus about the distribution of the sensible that is foundational to politics. When, however, Rancière attempts to analyze the primary aesthetics attending the popular uprisings of Paris in 2005, les, les the urban or suburban riots, the thing he finds political about them is not in regard to the direct expression of the rioters, but in the curating of their expression by the French group of artists called Urban Encampment. Rancière focuses analysis on the performance installation, Je et nous, I and you. That, that the, camp, the urban encampment set up in one of the riotous suburbs in which they created a space of solitude that was occupied by the inhabitants of the suburb one person at a time for the sake of lonely contemplation or meditation. The point was to solicit a statement from each member of the neighborhood who entered the place of solitude that was then silk screened by the artist onto a black t-shirt worn by the inhabitant who appeared in a video montage composed by the artists of numerous such similarly clad inhabitants. In the course of reading this video through the prism of a poetic statement by Mallarmé, Séparés, on était ensemble, apart we are together, Rancière elaborates three propositions defining an aesthetic community, which he describes as a community of sense or sensus communis. What he then says most certainly resonates with Ibn Sina's sense of el hissel mushterek, elaborated on earlier. The words of the poet are sensory realities which suggest another sensory reality which in turn can be perceived as a metaphor of the poetic activity. Yet, just as we're about to recognize this as concordant with Ibn Sina's analysis of poetic mimesis, it is made plain that even though the members of the neighborhood choose the statements on the t-shirt, the poetic energia is provided by Malachme and the urban encampment. It is they I'm, I'm one page away. It is they who compose the conditions of possibility for the expression of a specific subjectivity so that the first level of community manifested by the members of the neighborhood is a function of that composition. The words of the poet, Rancière says, are first used as neutral tools to frame a certain sensorium, but they superimpose that sensorium upon another sensorium organized around that which is specific to their own power, sound and absence. They stage a conflict between two regimes of sense, two sensory worlds. This is what the census means. Perhaps, but it is not what is meant by or concerns poetic socialities concomitant with al umma sharia What concerns poetic socialities are the conditions of possibility animated by the poetic expressions of those who are rioting. And apropos the Tunisian uprising, the poetic statement that most notably played a key role in generating the movement of Tunisian popular consciousness was the slogan that echoed around the world. The people want the end of the system, which was a synoptic paraphrasing of the Tunisian poet Abul Qasim Shebi's long 1933 Qasida poem, Will to Live. My contention is that such events draw attention to the spontaneity with which poetry expresses both the possibility of community and as such, they are instances of poetic socialities consonant with Ibn Sina's al sharia that is to say, they articulate a rupture in the order of things at the foundations of politics in which the possibility of a novel political subjectivity is manifest. I have a couple of paragraphs on Bauman, but I'm not going to read them because it's just uh, pointing out again how Bauman's own notion uh, 
of aesthetic sociality falls into the same trap that uh, Rancier does, because when he talks explicitly about the Midan movement of 2014 of Tunisia, he says that they're not going anywhere, they can't do anything. So it, it's a deafness to the poetic discourse that's occurring from among the masses. While Bauman acknowledges that aesthetic sociality entails poetic, powerful poetic imagery, he is dismissive of the capacity of those imaginings having any worldly effect. Now, to wrap up, ah. Arguably, the dissonance between poetic sociality and Rancière's aesthetic community and Bauman's aesthetic sociality has to do with the difference between their respective conceptual genealogies. Bauman's thinking about the relationship between aesthetic sociality and polity, and Rancière's thinking about the same, is circumscribed by the lineage of thought subsequent to Kant, inclusive of the Hegelian response, as well as the neo-Kantian alezimov and phenomenological and postmodern responses. While the thinking of poetic sociology expounded here today with you augments and so adjusts that lineage with the Arabic philosophical tradition. Attending to such events as the Tunisian Revolution from the perspective of poetic socialities entails taking seriously the capacity of poetry, the dynamic activity of creating, to give formal expression to the spontaneous intelligence of the people and thereby engender socialities not totally comprehended by the market-based processes of socialization, let alone the traditional political structures. Thank you. Yeah, I paid for that self-interruption. It stole three minutes. What? I paid for my interrupting myself. But that happens. We still have good time for questions. As the sun shines brightly, by the way. <laughs> I know that was a lot, but I, I think when I got to the Ibn Sina, you appreciated why I rehearsed what everybody knows about the Aristotle. Right? And, and this is foundational, that that, 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 that that tradition is concerned with the materiality the sensibility of sound in a very real way. And my allusion, of course, to the, the, the poetic pedagogies of Ta'rib, uh, the, the process that is very much part of my education as a law of Arabization, you know, it came out of an experience that was so resonant with what I grew up with, where you know, I can't tell you how many times I've sat around with friends and someone gives off a line of poetry. Kefa nebqa bi dhikr habibin wal manzili bin and everybody picks up the remainder of the lines of poetry and it starts to make a circle, right? And then a whole series of poetic recitation, which is a series of singing, begins to take place. And people remember, these are poems you learn in, 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 in primary school, and they remember all of the different poems that matter. And it's not a small matter that the Tunisian Revolution keeps identifying each year the poet of the revolution. Right? So th this is not just a, an obscure philosophical discourse. It's working at the level of the population, albeit admittedly as a consequence of the long-sustained post-independence projects of Arabization, of Ta'ari, of producing a particular Arab consciousness through these poetic forms, which of course then speaks to precisely my point about why, why they matter. So I, 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 I don't really apologize, but I'm trying to explain the arcane difficulties. So. All right, thanks so much for this talk. It was a uh, very masterful, I think, uh, performance, and um, you know, there's a lot for me to think about. Um, I wanted to ask something that I was thinking before you arrived at Rancière uh, in your uh, lecture, but then you know, became confirmed in a way because Rancière showed up in your discourse. When I'm thinking of um, Rancière, and uh, notion of census communis, for example, I'm not so much thinking back to Kant, but to Schiller and uh, the letters on aesthetic education, which is really a major uh, reference uh, for Rancière. For me, Rancière is really, not just for me, he is really a figure of what people have come to theorize as the aesthetic turn and yeah. political thought. Yeah. And your talk today really helped me, in a way, look back at sentient flesh and see it as participating in that turn, a kind of aesthetic turn in uh, uh, political thought, in a different way, of course, from what Rossier is doing, which is what you were explaining partly in the final uh, uh, essay, uh, final part of your, of your presentation. But I wanted to ask you about something here, which has to do with my own understanding of uh, the aesthetic turn in political thought. 
I have read this as a response to, so for example, in the work of Ancier, Claude Refort, people like Maurice Merleau-Ponty, as a response to what's called political theology, mm -hmm. right? So a kind of formulation of a, a, a concept of the aesthetical political, if you will. I don't know if you would use that to refer to your own uh, thinking, in response to a concept of theological political or theological conception of politics. So my question is, how does for you the emphasis on aesthetics poetics in the discourse that you presented today um, relate to theology and political theology? Yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, you know, Avancier is really quite uh, careful in wanting to qualify what he means by the aesthetic in relationship to the political, right? Mm -hmm. And differentiate himself somewhat from that movement. And I'm with you there because he wants to focus on aesthesis and this concept of, of a primary constitution of the, of, of, of the common world, the sensible world. Right? And, and that's the space in which the certain possibilities of subjectivity and of community organization can occur. And I'm agreeing with him there. And yes, it, it is, is very much a response to the, 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 the political theology, which of course this is explicit in, in, in this writing. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the fear for Anse, who still can, can, along this path, that, that the political theology is having tremendous force in the forms of ethno-nationalism and popularism, yeah. and, and, yes, and that the political theology is what has given the neoliberal subject its, its hegemonic grip on, on the planet's conceptualization of what Badiou refers to as you know, the general notion of subjectivity. And so it's a pushback. And yes, this, this is a leftist project in that regard. Right. This is to be expected from someone who contributed to the, the post-secular issue of Boundary too. This is, this is indeed marking a tradition of thinking in the aesthetic and the poetic and the political that is not grounded in the transcendental mm -hmm. and that is not teleological. Mm -hmm. right. Of course, I will point out, Ronce is quite clear that Schiller is an important reference, but so is Kant. In fact, he, he goes so far as to say when he elaborates his notion of Le Partage de Sensible, that he's, he's playing with, with Foucault's critique, but also Lyotard's critique of Kant's conception of judgment, right, and his conception of reflective judgment, and trying to sort of open that up and for once democratize it. So yes, uh, there, 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 is, there, is, there is a resonance, right? There's a similarity. The difference I want to make is a very important one. I'm coming at this from interacting with populations and particular practices, and this is, this is sort of the laying out of a, of a research project that I'm engaged in, that hopefully if I can get the proper funding, I'll, I'll go back to that part of the world and I'll, I'll hang out with these very particular groups that I listed and pay attention. There's a certain set of, 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 of practices they have that interest me, and it interests me at two levels, one around the question of poetic sociology, but also on the question of the, the American hegemony of the conceptualization of blackness. And, and what I mean by that is all of these groups have a certain notion of, of um, I want to be careful with my terms, but of, let's just say, possession. And the therapeutic function of, of, of song and dance and poetry to alleviate that possession. And they're scattered around the world. Pakistan, Oman, Iran, you have Zad in Iran, Ethiopia, but they have that similar conceptualization, that similar cosmology, and you find the same thing with the, the, the canoe in Cuba, you find that in the Hoodoo movements, and I'm interested in understanding those resonances. Why is that resonance there, and how does it speak to, to, to what we want to call, what I want to call the concept of blackness, as a particular kind of aesthetic way of being in common on the earth that is apositional to what has been the history of modernity, right? And, and, and their, their social status in common has something to do with that commonality. But I'm, I'm trying to engage those movements, and as I say, to engage, as I do in, in Sentient Flesh, their own thinking about what they're doing. Because they have, they have technopoetic, they have knowledges. And in doing that, trying to elaborate uh, uh, an argument, a concept of, of poetic sociality. Rancier, Badu, Badu's more friendly inclined, uh, uh, Bauman, they're not paying any any attention to those utterances, right? Their attitude is, is ethnographic and, and in a very clear way, right? So they're not engaging with those expressions. Those expressions sit on the margin and they become, in, in a way, very much like Heidegger's understanding of, of the African fetish, a certain kind of dissonant noise that the conceptual uh, genealogy they're working with can't get at, right? So it, it, their whole approach is merely uh, uh, a reinstantiation 
of of the of what I consider the destructive aspects of of of, of uh, capitalist imperial modernity. So that's why I depart. I, 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 we're on the same page about trying to come at the aesthetics, but it, well, I could summarize my critique somewhat like Alejo Carpentier's critique of the surreal, right? It ain't real. That, you know. <laughs> As he said, you have to come to the Americas to find the true, the true surreal. Thank you we're out of time. Quite a minute. Outstanding. Thank you so much.